I think one apology, and that's uh, Mr. Brody, and uh, <coughs> I don't think the independent representative will speak today. Have we got any declarations of interest? No? I right, please external representation committees. Uh, anything to add to the report? Uh, I think we'll go through them uh, piece by piece. Um, first one, I think it's the parent council representatives. And I think that came from the education committee. I don't know what members views on this one. That uh, we proceed, Colin. I mean, I don't have a problem with that. The, the only issue is, is when we proceed, I suppose. We don't really know what we're nominating them to in a few months' time. Um, we don't know what the format. I'm assuming we'll have an education committee. Uh, whether we'll have a big group of children's services committee or whatever, I don't know. But um, So whether or not it's worth actually tying the two together so that we can appoint people as to what the new committee structure is, I suppose, is a different question. It makes some sense in terms of timing. I wonder if that, just on the, on the back of what Colin's saying, you know, will that make more sense when we get the next kind of further on in the, in the reports? So my group's got a view in, in regard to that. I think it's certainly alluded to within the report 2017, new council coming forward December 16, maybe 17, something about there. But it's, I mean, we, uh, my, our view is that we're not at that report yet, but we could go through a transitional stage when we get to May 2017. Is this thing could be so winter. We, we are not averse to that at all, so I'm not preempting the decision that we'll make at that point in time, but I think I'm quite happy to, quite content that it, it's aligned to that process even. But if we make it beforehand, it doesn't really matter, it will come forward. Yeah, if we follow it through, it should only be that we're here for educational issues, not social ones, if you look at the third subcommittee here. Maybe that should be the word that comes out of that. If you want to start earlier, that Well, I think that's the point Colin's making, that, uh, okay, we've got an education committee at the moment to keep the structure it, and uh, deal purely with the last of the chief executive is basically educational. But under the new structure, the director of education will have responsibility for social work, uh, leisure and sport, CLD. And again, you've got to look at what's in the structure, and you have that one committee sitting there for the entire day, and then get to the stage where you say to parents, teachers, and church reps that you're going to have to leave now. We're on a different agenda item. So, the consensus I'm getting is you want to agree to have these appointments, but it'll take place as and when we've looked at the committee structures we're going to have for the education service. Is that, is that what I'm picking up? Ian? Can I just do some clear in regard to the, the members on the education committee as it stands? That's embedded within legislation. So, how does that tie in to what's potentially being in? Proposed, I think it's is it part of legislation. We have to have church, church representatives, so on and so forth. So therefore, there's still there is an entitlement there already out with our, our gift of changing that. So I would imagine if we're going to change it, we'll have to work around about that legislation. So I would have thought that the, the committee structure will but have what, to be similar. What, what the legislation used to state, I don't know, about 1988, I think it was that uh, church, churches had to be represented, three three representatives, uh, teachers had the right to be there. The government changed the rules, fell out with teachers, and that was one of the most punitive actions against teachers, was to remove their right to serve an education committee. Former uh, regional council, along with quite a, a number of other education authorities in Scotland, said, fine, there's no statutory right, but we'll continue giving you your right to be there and fund since uh, the 1920s. So it wouldn't matter what we did if we didn't appoint parents who could decide to take teachers off. As the law stands, there's no statutory right to appoint representative under whatever committee structure we have, but they're only there for the purposes of education. So it depends what committee structure we set up. Alistair? Thanks, Chair. I, I, I basically agree with that. I, I think it's important, sir, that this, this council, you know, every opportunity to refer, you know, reaffirm their, their commitment, as it were, to enhancing community involvement in the, uh, the decision-making process. And I don't know how long it'll take to move to move to the, the brave new world of revised committee systems and structures. But my own personal view is that you know this is the right decision to take at this moment in time. 
I think we should agree it today, recommend it to the council. Presumably there will be a period of time uh, you know, taken before the, the new structures, uh, committee structures are agreed and are in place. Uh, and I would like to think that, you know, at that time with the appropriate can-do attitude on the part of the authority, we'll work our way around, uh, as it were, issues of the type which have been raised this morning. But I think to me, it sends out an important message uh, to the community uh, that we are going to uh, allow uh, you know, these two representatives to participate in the work of this committee uh, and that it will recommend accordingly to the council and we'll proceed uh, down that particular route. Okay, as I've said, uh, we probably will have to revise certain aspects of the appointment at the appropriate time, but well, let's do that and let's adopt the can-do attitude in the doing. That's, my, that's where I'm coming from. So I think, I think what we're saying is that we'll recommend to full council the appointment be made and uh, it'll take effect at the time when we've decided what the committee structures may be for the further and swift uh, education service. The, okay, fine. Uh, the, the, the appointment will be made, but you know, is there any reason why you know the people can't be appointed and, and, and it can't be, you know, they, 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 they can't function and work uh, and within the parameters of the education committee chair as currently existing, in the knowledge, of course, that you know. Uh, that, that structure will, will inevitably be altered going forward, but will review their, their, their input and their involvement at that time. That, that's, that's basically where, where I'm coming from. I, I prefer not to divide, you know, in, in this at all possible, but that, 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 that's my view. Chair, we used to have the old, I can't remember what it was called at the time, it was education, social work, everything seemed to be in there. And at that time, you had the school, the teacher and the church representative appropriate time they left the room because it wasn't working and it sort of split up. That caused a sort of wee issue because of the fact we did the education work first and called on the social work to let people away and I think staff felt that the social work was a tag on um, that hopefully something similar could happen and have the processes that we had before that we could do that. I don't see why we couldn't appoint them now onto the committee and then morph them into the new committee at the appropriate I think that's broadly where I was coming from. I mean, clearly we have an education committee now and we will have issues with education matters. I very much took on board Colin's aside that there might be an issue in, in terms of how we define what is that impact on education matters. So grouping things together um, along the lines that, 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 that we are looking at, there's clearly going to be synergies and, and tie-ins with matters that wouldn't necessarily, well, in fact, currently don't come to the Education Committee, but that we would, I think we could safely argue would come under the broader umbrella. So I think that's something we're going to have to look at and, and, and work our way through. I just wonder if it's maybe a more productive way to do that with these representatives still being in the room with us rather than being brought in after we've looked at it. I, I just wonder. Okay. Right. So, okay, okay I, th I think we're all agreed that uh, we'll support the two people going on. It's a question of when. Uh, I think Colin's suggestion is we delay the implementation. It's just a key member saying, so I can let more of the present education committee meeting now. Ian? Are you happy to go on with that, Colin? You know? Right, okay. So we agree, and they, they can come on to the existing education committee. Obviously, have to pay full to stay at the room. If I could just add, Chairman, that I don't know how long the process will take to actually get in place and start now. There's a couple of funds that are pending aside from the Okay, the next one on this uh, uh, item is the Wigton uh, representation of Wigton Area Committee wishing to have Community Council representatives on the area committees. Uh, any further to add to that? Any members? Alistair? Oh, okay. Uh, I, I would merely uh, repeat, Chair, and, uh, and make no apologies for doing so that, you know, uh, I think it's important that the Council do re reaffirm their commitment to enhancing community involvement in their decision-making processes. Uh, what we have here uh, is a, a 
suggestion uh, from the Working Area Committee. Uh, all members, as far as I'm concerned, so, uh, have uh, supported the, these proposals, as indeed have the community representatives. I appreciate, uh, and I'm not suggesting for one minute, uh, no respect for, uh, for, for uh, Rona Lewis, uh, you know, I appreciate that you know, various uh, potential issues have been flagged up, uh, as it were, uh, in the report, which uh, I would concede will require uh, additional consideration. Uh, and in these circumstances, uh, I'm prepared, uh, rather than uh, lose it uh, on the day, and I'm being totally honest about it, I'm prepared to suggest to agree that we, we, we look further uh, at refining these proposals or indeed at any other uh, suitable alternative proposals. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, there is certainly a groundswell of opinion in my own area. I understand that that's replicated elsewhere in Dumfries and Galloway communities, as it were, wanting a greater say in the decision-making process, uh, and I'm all for that. Uh, what I would say, uh, as I've indicated, that you know, if, if you want to, to have a further look, want to refine it, want to look at alternatives, I've no, I've no problems, I've no difficulties with that. One plea I would make, Chair, uh, hopefully we'll get to the stage of uh, trialling something, and bearing in mind that, that you chose Wigtown, uh, as it were, for the trialling of the revised refuse collection routes, and you've heard me in this one before, I would like to think that Wigton would be uh, chosen as a trial uh, trial area for, uh, for for greater community uh, involvement in the area committee functioning. So that's where I'm coming from. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chairman. I think both personal and uh, group view in regards to this was actually, if we're, if we're going to come forward with something like this, it has to be on an equitable basis. Therefore, we would have to, we, we, our preference would very much be to consult fully across all four area committees if we've got to do anything with this at all. So we wouldn't like to see anything like this being approved today in regards to taking it forward, e even as a uh, pilot project, but certainly more than up for putting it across, putting on it as an agenda item across the rest of the area committees and see what potentially we're absolutely clear and making a fully informed decision in regards to how we best take this forward. Because e each individual here has its own set of circumstances and we could possibly adapt to each individual area in a particular case. Thanks, Chairman. I think, I mean, there's something in this, and I don't think that we want to, um, we certainly don't wish to be seen to be effectively riding roughshod over a, a, a legitimate community interest um, and uh, an interest in, in some level of greater involvement. I think it would be fair to say that the, the idea that, that, that came forward, the one that most caught my eye of every community member in the area being able to ask a question on every relevant item would fundamentally change the nature of this committee and uh, I mean I suspect we may need a, an area committee meeting every week in order to actually dial in enough time to, to, to allow that to happen. I don't think that particular um, solution or proposal is actually workable but equally I don't want to throw out the idea of old tales. I, I don't think that's a frivolous idea to do either. We also, I think, have a tension between um, the, the issue of having an equitable approach and what area committees are already able to do, because I, I note that actually, as matters stand, the area committee could co-opt people uh, if, we, if we saw fit. I don't know if it's happened at any times in the past, certainly as far as I'm concerned, 2007. Um, maybe further back, who knows? Um, although I, I also recognize the area committee was different every year, there were, there were more of them that were smaller in some cases. Um, I'd be quite happy for it to go out to um, the other area committees to have a look at. Um, I, the report, for example, highlights the issue in the, the Stewartsy, for example, the Community Federation Commission wouldn't work with the Stewartsy because we don't have a federation. Uh, we have a very large number of community councils by comparison with the number of elected members. So again, we have 10 members and there's 23 community councils. So the, the, the working group solution that, that's so far being proposed wouldn't necessarily work with us either. Um, but I come back to the point that I'm I'm not totally comfortable with saying at this point, well, let's not do anything with it at all. Let's not explore any further. I think perhaps it's a, a, an amalgam of what um, the, the, the two suggestions that have been brought forward so far. We can maybe have a, a bit of a further look at this to see if there's anything better that we can come up with. Um, I, I don't think that would be too unusual. Thank you. Well, I think from my point of view, uh, I, w I wasn't very much in favour of uh, certain aspects because if you've got over 20 community councils on an area committee and you're asking 
that each one has a rep there with the right to raise one question on each report. That is a right that elected members don't even have, right? The, the right for elected members to speak is very much in the hands of the chairman of the committee. So why would you give outside people a right that elected members don't have? And if you want to change your stand orders to allow every elected member the right to ask one question on every item agenda, that's fine. Bring your sleeping bags in. Um, the, the, the other point on, on uh, that one is that my, my group did have a brief discussion on this. And uh, if community councillors have got an interest in a particular item on the agenda, if they were to put that in in writing on the Friday before the meeting, that could be entered into the meeting by the appropriate officer saying we had a, an inquiry from such and such community council about this agenda item. Uh, now, if the community council got somebody was present to listen to what the answer was and what happened during that debate, that's fine. Uh, or they could be given a written answer after the committee meeting. That's something else to consider. And that gives them a, an input, if you like. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly know from uh, over the years having attended area committee meetings, the number of times community council or the representative of the community council turns up are few and far between. And certainly there were agenda of any great uh, enthusiasm for community councils in this day, although they were indeed sure to, that some of them may want to be involved. Certainly have reservations, but I think there's a way to accommodate them without necessarily having any representation. That's what I'm trying to say. Ivor? Yeah, and I think one of the big problems I find is we get the papers a week in advance of the meeting. The public gets the paper the day after. Now, there are very few community councils that meet in between those two times. So are you getting a community council view? Or are you getting an individual who's put themselves forward view? Now, that could skew, if somebody knows how to work the system, you could actually get people who might have wanted to be a councillor or something, didn't get in, got on there, and they've got an input where other people who may have the community's interest at heart wouldn't get the opportunity. It's one of the things, when I go to community councils, here we are, look at this, they send this out, give you two weeks to consult on it, two weeks just after you've had the meeting. So you can't actually get a community council view on it. Um, I don't know how you would get questions in whether the community councils are happy to do that. Because one of the things the community council says, you know, we want it so we can discuss it at our meeting. We don't want people to phone up and read it ourselves. It's there in front of us. And they have troubles with that. That's my experience from community councils in the area I serve. You've also got the fact that if you watch, I can't speak, I know Mid Galloway was very popular in terms of these meetings when it was the Mid Galloway area of the day. Um, I think Upper Mistdale was, I think it was the Mid and Upper Mistdale community. It was the one where you got a lot of representation. I know when it was Lower Mistdale and since we've moved to the Mistdale area of the day, the, our three stalwarts. Why Mr. Service would turn up and dress on occasions and something that was of interest. Now, I would have thought if it was something of interest that liked Alan Mistel, there's different areas that have different ways of working. So maybe Ian's proposing to actually take it out to the people what they want and how they can manage it might give us some ideas better than going out and doing something. I mean, I, I, the one issue I've got, I have to say, is that not every area has a community council, uh, and why should there be preferential treatment for those areas that choose to have a community council? Very often it's for a perfectly legitimate reason. Uh, part of my ward, Cresswell, doesn't have a community council. They have a tenants and residents association, and actually they see that as an appropriate forum, uh, and councillors go along and meet and get questions, and uh, the lads want social housing there, so it's, it's a good way to see things. Um, and they're quite happy with that. There's other areas that don't have community councils because they haven't been able to get interest uh, out of uh, Dumfries and Lower Mistdale, 25 community council areas, there's only 16 community councils, so effectively you'd be disenfranchising large areas from having the same rights as others in terms of membership of, of the committee. So that's a big concern I have, I have to say. I don't know what the answer is, um, but I think at the very least, area committees should be consulted. I think the idea that we could take a decision 
effectively to recommend something to be imposed on either committee that I've never actually discussed there and the way of working would be unfair. So certainly I think where the committee should be is should be certainly consulted. Th thanks, Chair. I'll try not to rehearse the comments I made earlier. Uh, you know, I don't think there was any, there was certainly never any intention, as it were, on the part of the Working Area Committee, uh, that you know anything should be imposed as it were on other area committees. It, it was on the basis of you know uh, unanimity in that particular committee, uh, supported by uh, community council representatives uh, who were involved in the short-term working group process. But uh, really, the, the point I wanted to make uh, was picking up on an Ivor's suggestion, a, a reference rather, uh, to such as the uh, the McGallery Area Committee. You know, the irony uh, in, in that regard, Chair, is that uh, that developed on a purely ad hoc basis, and it, it wasn't a preferential role that was given to community councils. People, community council representatives turned up there at that meeting, but they turned up at these meetings, but they turned up there uh, as members of the public, uh, and, and the involvement and the input was absolutely superb. And let me pay tribute to Sandra McDowell. It was due primarily to the inclusive and superb chairpersonship with which she ran that particular committee. I've seen 30, 40 members of the public there uh, actively being encouraged by the chair and various members to, to, to make their views known on, on whatever they felt, to make their view, views known on, on specific items of business. And you didn't get everybody coming in, as it were, for the Isle of Whitehorn, you know, to sort of Glen Troll uh, in every particular item. Uh, as I say, I would be the first to consider it was an, it, it was an ad hoc basis. Uh, it was made quite clear uh, when it came to decision making time, it was the five elected members that took the decisions. Very often what you picked up at the end of the day from uh, you know, the involvement, the input, the interaction uh, was a benefit you know, when you came to make the decision. I appreciate that you, you know, that it worked at that time. Uh, you've got to bring much more of a structure uh, to it uh, and I would be the first to, to, uh, to be supportive of that. So uh, to an extent uh, I might have seen the future, I certainly participated in it. Uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, if we do this sensitively and with a light touch, and by all means, Chair, after due consultation, I think there's mileage to be made out of it. That's the plea I make. I'm grateful to you for your support. Just as a kind of point, picking up on, on after what people are saying, I think I've summed up very well what's probably happening now at the moment in regards to the common good and the way the are being presented here. But what I will say is that, uh, we, well, we do have, a, I think the same with the people as well, aren't we? without skipping over that point, we actually have a uh, representative sitting on the area committee, which could be a subcommittee, common good being a subcommittee, which could probably say, so that is actually <coughs> taking place at the moment, but we've had some quite heated debates in regards to, in the, uh, certainly in Ireland, common good, but every time, once it does settle, some really good learning points come from it, and it's like Alice was kind of touching on in regards to being open and transparent and communicating well with, with, with the local area. Sometimes people have got maybe their own ambitions and they want to try and better them through that type of conduit, you could say, but nine times out of ten, we always, always, we're always in a better position once we've been through the rough times. And I think it, there is a place for them, but it needs to be fully, needs to be e equitable. At least every year the committee should get the chance to put forward their, their, uh, their, their say and what they, how they think they are the best, uh, the best solution would be for them, so they could then e even take an individual choice of which area committee could, uh, could take this forward. I suppose that, that's the bulk of it. I mean, I do think it really can work if we do it right, but it's got to be the numbers need, need to be one that's uh, handled by the people that sit on the area committee. Again, point and barrack is probably something that we're all going to be able to do. Just one observation, and again, Chair, I'm grateful to you for your allowing me back in. Uh, it's right and proper that we do go out and consult other area committees. Uh, I would suggest perhaps that if in the doing so, if any particular member or any members of the, the Council Corporate Management team have any alternative suggestions which come to mind, I think it would be worthwhile, as it were, incorporating these in the consultative process as well. Uh, I think you know we should be consulting, and since we're going to consult, there are alternative models. Uh, let, let's flag these up to be of assistance to, to all four area committees uh, as well, Chair. It depends. <clears throat> if you want to go out to consultation, you can write to the councillors and say, uh, what, what are your views on having greater participation? I certainly can't agree with the paper presented by Wigton going out to consultation. Uh, there's no way you can have uh, one person from every community council allowed to ask one question and never out of the agenda. I think 
that is totally uh, unacceptable. What I was suggesting earlier when I first came in, Chairman, was that three, two point three. After considering it, I think I mean I would certainly be happy to move that a the committee take this forward and obviously would communicate with the community every community council at that point. It'd be an agenda item on on the committee community council to be involved, even if we gave them a couple of months for warning, so they'd, they would like I were fixed up a lot of them, they didn't get the chance to discuss our items as a community council, and, they, and they've got certain representatives that, that come forward sometimes representing their own view, and I think it's only fair that the community council as a whole get a chance to make a point. I would certainly be happy to, to add to 2.3 that considered that, but I take it we ask the committee to take this forward. We, we get a further report back here once we're fully informed. Can we maybe get a consensus that, that we take the other area committees to uh, elicit their views on how we take this forward? I mean, I think you've got to remember the point made by Colin that uh, it's only just uh, Annandale and Estelle and Stuart Tray who've got the whole areas covered with community councils. I mean, uh, there's only two thirds of Wigton and uh, two thirds in this still covered, and they tend to be the urban areas. I mean, uh, Colin said Cresswell, Sophia, uh, parts of Wincloden, Sandside don't have uh, community councils, and these are areas like Sandside and uh, Wincloden where there are problems and probably to do with the uh, support. But we do have tenants and residents associations, so maybe you've got to consider them. But it's how you do it, whether you do it. Set of grave reservation myself with one person from each one of these organisations. It just becomes absolutely the case in this day will be looking at uh, even more folks sitting around the table when we've got a full council meeting. <coughs> so I'm happy to go to consultation with the other area committees. Yep. Okay, if we go to the uh, recommendations. Uh, Alistair? Just, just uh, again, sir, you made a very valid point uh, about tenants and residents associations. Uh, when this was discussed uh, uh, on various occasions at the area committee, I mean, I, I, for instance, took the view that, you know, restricting it to community councils could leave you open to the challenge of being somewhat restrictive. I mean, we now have a Tara a Tenants and Residents Association in at least one location in Wigita, and if these people wanted to come along to an area committee and raise issues which they felt were particularly appropriate, I personally feel at the end of the day uh, that they should be entitled and indeed encouraged to do so. I go back to what I said, uh, and the ad hoc days when this arrangement w developed and worked with mid a mid family context, it was on the basis chair, it was members of the public, it wasn't members of community council, members of Taras, or members of whoever. Uh, anyway, thanks again for your letting me back. New recommendations, 2-1. Uh, you give me that one. 2-2. Uh, two, two. Uh, under 2-3, uh, I think we're agreeing there to go to consultation with the area committees on proposals to include uh, community councils, etc. Members happy with that? Item 4, review of standing orders and schemes of delegation. Uh, I think maybe the easiest way is to go through these one by one. Standing order, it's uh, item 331 and page 11, standing order 10 3 voting. I note here at a recent training event advocate that best practice was now there should be no voting by ballot. Um, I think there's a couple of different issues here. Uh, I think when it comes to the election of council leader in various positions for elected members, uh, nowadays because of political uh, divide in the council, you might as well do it by uh, yeah, roll call anyway, because you can probably predict the result before you walk in the room in any case. So the committee could just do it openly. Uh, my, my own view is that uh, when it comes to officers, I think there's, uh, as we do with the dismissals, it is done by roll call. And, uh, I think, sorry, it's done by secret ballot. And I think that should be for appointments as well. Because I think if you have a minuted decision and uh, you've been appointed somebody and disappointed maybe three other people, uh, and that becomes a matter of public record how elected members voted. And that, that can lead to an uncomfortable position if you happen to be, say, a committee chairman and it becomes apparent you voted for somebody who's not the director with whom you're working. And I don't think that leads to good, uh, a good relationship. I'm not saying that folk carry vendettas or anything, but you never know. <laughs> there are certain councillors and certain officers I've known over the years that uh, I'd be very worried about them carrying a vendetta. But... Uh, I think a word they want, I mean, I'll open it to members, but I certainly have my reservations about uh, 
appoint an office person. I think I really do believe that can still be done by uh, ballot. But I'll, I'll leave it to Colin. I refrain from suggesting that the appointment of senior councillors could be done by a game of musical chairs or something. Um, but um, I think I think there is a difference between. I think I think I'm more concerned about the issues around tribunals than, than the appointment of senior positions. But I think maybe the the, the, the way to deal with that um, would be to have a system whereby employment issues are dealt with, continue to be dealt with by ballot. But when it comes to the appointment of of, of councillors and leaders, etc., that should be a, a roll call. So I think we agree that uh, for appointment of councillors to any position, that be done by uh, roll call. When it comes to appointment or um, dismissal or other disciplinary matters, that's still carried out by, by ballot. Members happy with that? Staying in order eight is the uh, quorum. Uh, I think that's straightforward. I mean, it should only be the voting members who comprise the, the quorum. Members happy with that? I'd say we've had a lot of debate in regards to the subject as well, that uh, common good certainly in Annan. And I just I just throw it out there just to I'd like to hear what members think. I mean, think just taking into consideration it might be an option because we struggle to get a quorum. We've got four members, quorum's three, and we do struggle at times to get a quorum. So we wouldn't have any voting rights in regards to that. But certainly I mean another thing I've got to bring up in regards to that is certainly I think as a proposal, I'd like to be debated with us at this particular point or further on in that report, but the possibility of a, a particular member of a representative committee, I think, being a vice chair. We only have a chairman on our common good, but I mean, in regards to being able to access maybe information and such like that, it's been a, a real issue in regards to or getting it in a continuous fashion, I think. Now, if it was a chair and a vice chair that are in common good, I think that, and the vice chair would uh, certainly would vote, but the vice chair would be a representative of the council in our case. And that's probably, probably help take away a lot of the anxiety and debate as well. Maybe it's East Annan that's in that position. I'm just asking. I'll, no, I mean, it would never vote. That's what I'm saying. So if for some reason the vice chair was acting as a, that's why I, quite, that's why I think it's a good thing to debate. If for some reason the, the chair wasn't there and the vice chair was acting, I mean, the trouble we've got is co common goods are decision-making bodies. You can be dealing with uh, money. Now, if you include uh, representatives who are not uh, newly elected members of the council as part of your quorum, you could effectively have one councillor turning up and 14 of the council reps turning up. That way your quorum, that way you've got a quorum. But the only person making the decision is that one elected member. And that is patently totally wrong and opens up yeah, all sorts of issues. So your quorum has got to consist of elected members, I would suggest. You can't have any deviation. Alistair? Th thanks, Chair. You know, I, my, my own view is that, uh, by all means, encourage uh, or, or, or yeah, create space for, for, for uh, non-council representatives on the common good, but they're there, they don't have a vote, uh, and they should certainly not be uh, counted you say, uh, part of a quorum. Uh, again, you know, for instance, in the, 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 the Port Harbour Wigton uh, Common Good Committee, all three uh, Bid Gallery members uh, are trustees of the Port Harbour Trust, and there's been occasions when the Port Harbour Trust, of course, made application for funding from the Port Harbour Common Good. Uh, all three of us have had to declare an interest, and it's put to the area committee, and the area committee determine the application. You know, there's ways, as I say, if you adopt a can-do attitude, there's ways around it and that sort of thing. So my own view would be that at the moment, we appear to have created space. I think your, your argument is very well put in regards to you know, first the senior member making decisions as opposed to the chair. That would go a long way with that, entirely. But in regards to uh, the vice chair, you can't do anything. It's certainly a separate issue. I can maybe bring it up at the end if you want. Well, I mean, yeah. deal with it now. I mean, is, is there a need for a vice chair and a committee of four councillors and four others? You know. And at the end of the day, what you've got to think of, if you're just doing it to be nice to the team of councillors, okay, one of you could be the vice chair. If the chairman's not there, the vice chair goes into the chair, um, then go to a vote. He hasn't got a vote anyway. He certainly hasn't got a deliberative vote. Now, you've got four members, but I'm thinking of Nisdale, which is a bigger one. You then had a chairman who's not a councillor, and the committee divided 4-4. Four, four. 
كثير نقدر ليش هيك عم بدي اجيري ابلاننج كمان انه كل ابايك شير انه شير كذا بخويا بالانترا اسك هذا بخويا بالانترا يا بلازي اي ما كاش تو مي دو سك سك وات ذن هابن ذس وات يو كان بين ابلاننج ميت ذا واي اب دو ميك ا ديسيجن سو دونت ثينك يو كان هاف سمدي هو هاز نوت غوت ا فوتن رايت بوزيشن اوف شير بيكوز وان رولز اوف شير ان ايفري ثينج يو دونت فيل يو كان ميت ذا ديسيجن سو اي دونت I, no, I think it's, I just want to hear what people will think, and that was as much as that. I just want to hear because it's something that will certainly feed back Aaron and the community council. They, they will be eager to hear that, and I think it's a fair response. I think it is. It's probably what they're trying to achieve is more about being included as part of the decision making to feel that they're, they're making fully informed decisions. There's other routes we can certainly take. It. No, I think it's been valid. And the hours are covered, I think. That's the um, substitution on Common Good Committee. I think it's happened in the Stuart way for some reason that uh, Kubri uh, Common Good Committee, and was it when George Prentice was chairman of, what had happened was that they didn't have a quorum, so the chairman of the area committee, which was George Prentice at the time, substituted. Um, as Alistair says, what currently happens, you can't reach a decision if you have a quorum at an area committee. At a common good, it goes to the area committee. I mean, at the end of the day, the council is responsible. The council, as a body, is responsible for common good. We delegate to the area committee to then have the common good committee. So it seemed appropriate that uh, you can't have substitution because it is the locality that matters. And the area committee should be the body to make any decisions, and there's some reason why the common good committee can't do it. Members happy to continue that? Ivor? Yeah, it's not just me being pedantic, but this paragraph isn't right. It says that a uh, common good subcommittee can consist of the relevant ward members. Miss Dale won business with her brief because you were 16, you were in the Dundee committee, who have areas within the common good. The women have a subcommittee, so just like keep things in. I, d I, d I did think about that, and uh, I was hoping the word relevant would apply because it's relevant how to um, Dumfries, how we deal with that, but we, we only choose certain ones. Three, four down to. Uh, the end basically, um, and that's the committee structures. And I think the question is being asked there at 391 uh, should structure and delegations broadly reflect the organisation of services are did under the shape of the council, i.e., four committees and integration joint board? Um, certainly, certainly. So, what, what's members' views on this one? Colin? I think that's a common sense starting point. I think that's, you know, that made the point before that the committee should follow the budget, if you like, follow the directorate. Uh, I think the starting point is to start off with the new directorate. Um, I think I suggested a piece of work, I think it's alluded to in the report, a piece of work gets done. If you looked at the last what, six or seven meetings of each of the current committees and you put them into the new directorate, what would our agenda look like? And my instinct tells me that our community's agenda would probably be 40 items or something like that, and we are not the same. But that, that, that effectively should be the starting point. You take your four new committees, you put the items on the agenda for the four new committees based on the new structures and delegation, which is pretty obvious, um, and then you take things out because presumably in some cases the agenda will be far too long, and that's the kind of starting point. Rather than looking at what we've got at the moment, is actually what would, what looking at the new four directorships that you then remove to make the committees more manageable. So communities might view that you start off with a certain agenda uh, that might be at 40 items. What do you do? Maybe you remove Hilton from there, um, and you have a subcommittee um, to either pay funds for a community or something like that, um, which is the Hilton. So I think that's the way to look at it, is to look at the starting point being the new directorship, and then what would you have to remove to make those committees more manageable and maybe having subcommittees in some certain places. But I think the starting point is still, you know, you, is the, is the new committee structure good? Issues around the enterprise arm and health, that would all tie in with the new structures and the way the challenges we've had in the past where EI makes a decision and um, these 
what they did to make me meet Nina in the high school. Um, she was at the back of the next state in the song team, Blue Lock, and so something that happened, I think they can avoid that, and that's a concern I think. I think that's, that's I'll come to that in a second, but I think that's a starting point. I don't know if the members think that. You should look at the kind of basic principle of new directorship. If you've got a bit of a mess at the moment with some things or directorship has got responsibility for somebody, you've got to commit to what other parts of your directorship are responsible for. So I think that's a good starting point. Yeah. I, th I think just following from Colin saying it, if you did start off, I think that's something that needs to bring to the government. If you look at item five, that is a list of what is delegated to the kind of core corporate directors. So they, they would bring forward an agenda to say, I'll, I'll give you, for instance, if you take uh, Warner's area, that's policy and resources basically within there. But in that, if you have employment in the field, you would have pension civic government licensing, because they are all part of the Warner's responsibility. What Scotland highlights is community housing, welfare, police and fire may well fit in there. That's something we've got to take into a different context. Um, again, if you look at the UNI, then UNI would have to take on planning, uh, local review bodies, etc. So if you start off with the four, the delegate, the four delegation of people at the four directors, and then decide, no, you can't have four directors, that's far too big. So when I go back to looking at P and R, you've got all the stuff that would be added in there, like employment, field, pension, civic government, licensing, etc. Talking to members of that committee have been looking at 30 or 40 things a year. Um, P and I, if you added on planning, local review body, etc., again, over 30 would need to be here. Um, so, and the community committee, I, mean, I hate to hazard a guess how many uh, meetings a year you have there. Similar with the education, social service, PL, and support. How do you handle that? Does that need to go to the Scotland Group that we discussed earlier? Does that need to go to one of the committees? And then point out if you meet as education and then say to the Scotland Group or anybody else, you've got to leave. I was quite direct. That's what happened the last time we tried to record the body. It just looked like a takeover by another service and by the education department. That is one of the reasons why we suggested the directors move over to the current offices elsewhere, because there no seem to be just uh, takeovers by one, one department or another department. So I think there's food for thought there. Maybe, <clears throat> I don't think we're going to reach a definitive decision today, but I think it's something, I think Colin set the ball rolling by saying, okay, let's look at the four committees, and then realise, once you see the responsibilities, you only have the four committees and not the four corporate so if a paper is brought back to like that, then you can slice away and take over the structure of the committee that you want. So I hope to members on that. Thanks, Chairman. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with that. I mean, my, my starting point in my notes was to answer your question is probably yes. The more I've thought about it, possibly. I think we, we look at the four, the big four, as they would be, whatever it is in the, in the committee. Um, not least because one of the things that just occurred to me now while you're speaking is that if you if you didn't subdivide in some sensible manner, I I wonder how on earth you'd ever get a real agenda for one of those committees produced, and certainly how on earth you'd get the mixed agenda produced because the, the timescales would be absolutely crazy. We'd probably have dozens and dozens of people with mixed agendas, which given what we were looking at at the business transformation steering group that took place yesterday isn't going to happen. Uh, so yeah, I think that's probably a logical way forward. It's about a, probably a good deal more to make sure on this before we can get to a sensible proposal. Yeah, I think Colin's right. We should start with what's actually the direct responsibility. I think there's also two types of committee. There's the policy committee, which is what Mr. Davies was talking about, the sort of what I would call the practical side where you have your employment, appeals, et cetera. So that's something that actually can split out if, if you've got a big committee that you want to take control. Well, on to, I mean, if, for instance, you take the policy committee, I mean, there's things we get consulted on. There's two government 
skills that are in the qualification, which have never come from near us as elected members, but we're having to save them. And that's a matter of the policies in the country. But whether you'd want that same committee to have subcommittees dealing with uh, licensing, subcommittees dealing with employment and appeals, or you totally separate committees who are there to carry out these practical issues, you know, they, they, don't, they don't have the sight of a budget. They're carrying out the, the function of licensing. The budget's still controlled by the policy. So it's that separation of running organisation and actually carrying out the function to overburdening, you know, say 20 members of one committee have a B50 each, where maybe another committee of 20 members sitting there still doesn't. So try to set up, you know, you've got to look at the elected members when you're setting up committees and subcommittees as well, making sure you're not overloading them and then sometimes end up with no getting a quorum. So I think we're heading in the right direction. Alistair? Just to reaffirm, as far as I'm concerned, sir, what you're suggesting is eminently sensible and practical. I suppose the only thing we've not touched on, maybe it's not appropriate here, but I think for the next council, when, when you do appoint your senior members of the council, it would probably just be a carte blanche. We, start, we, we, we tend to align them to committees and so on and so forth because of the way it's structured, because there, there will probably be every bit as many, there will be as many committees. I'm sure there will be you've outlined the model, what's still there? Hasn't it changed to any great degree other than a wee bit of paperwork? There's still five members of council working on social health stuff, as well as health. So I think probably, and it's the only thing, and maybe it's not appropriate here, but it's something that I think the next council needs to look at as it goes forward. But with the appointment, you know, just make the appointment, and then that will distribute autonomy. Because the workload's still there. It'll maybe look on the face of it as if, uh, because of the committee structure's reduced from, say, six or seven to three or five, down to four, but the workload's still there, so that's not going to happen. But it's probably, and I certainly, and as long as we keep members fully involved, I'm going to have a viewpoint. Are you happy with that, Lord? Do you know it's going to be coming? I mean, if you can't, that definitely details what your, the various departments are doing, and therefore, if you then look at committees based on that, maybe have to sub, subdivide them somewhere along the line. Yeah, thanks, absolutely. Um, I've already done a bit of work around the last 12 months, going back to the end of June, I think, and I think we have a bit of analysis, so that's where we'll start to start to discuss the um, and also some information we can perhaps go back to the previous committee. Thanks. That's all sensible. Can, can I just touch on the, the, the other questions, or just because um, they are, I think, quite interesting questions that, that, that certainly should try to give. An I was going to just gonna suggest, Colin, I'll just go through the next. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, fine, yeah, yeah. So if we move, that's going to cover three nine one, three nine two, and I think three nine three, three nine four, three nine five. Would we suggest that these carry on as they are at the moment until they come up with a new a new structure? Obviously, they, they will have to carry it on at the moment until we come up with a new structure. Um, I think that I think the, the issues around housing and welfare reform are dealt with effectively by the piece of work that we'd say we start off with the communities committee. If it's too big in terms of items on the agenda, we look at what areas could be taken out. Housing is an obvious one. Welfare reform, I think, will be slightly different because of the whole anti-poverty strategy agenda. Maybe, um, you know. A wider remit might be needed there, I don't know, but um, certainly I think that piece of work that we talked about earlier would be the, the way to deal with housing and welfare reform rather than simply say, um, we just continue as it is, you know, do, are they two of the things that we might remove from communities uh, to lighten the load in communities and, and give more scrutiny to those those particular areas. The, the first one's a wee bit different, that, because it depends what route you go down in terms of um, the corporate services type areas around employment, around licence and all that sort of thing. You know, I think that there's a there's an argument to say that you have a separate corporate services committee um, that oversees that department and therefore the policy and resources are a different thing. But there'd be no point in doing that if you then also had other employment rights and all that sort of thing. So I think I think there's a discussion to be had around that because I think we've kind of the anomaly at the moment is that the policy committee oversees a department, if you like, you know, so there might be a, a piece of work to be done. 
uh, on that, whether or not you have a separate corporate services committee. I think that might be a bit light when you take out licensing and all that, but it's certainly a, a, a discussion we should have. In terms of the police one, if you'd asked me this question six months ago, should we have a separate police committee? I'd say it's a waste of time, don't have any authority, don't have any powers at all. It's just going to be a talking shop. But actually, fortunately, at long last, we might see a change in that and we might see a return to an element of at least meaningful local scrutiny and local accountability of Police Scotland. Uh, therefore, my instinct tells me that we should look to maintain that in the moment, at the very least, until we see the outcomes of the government's review into that, because there may, at long last, be some sort of hope that, that the Police Committee will actually have a role in, in Police Scotland, basically. Um, I mean, are you going to go into the next ones after that, or do you want to just keep going? No, I, th I think th these ones here, obviously, they, they all hinge on what we decide on after we read it the first matter. So it's just to ensure the business carries on, that for the moment, the housing, the welfare, and the police carry on up to such time as we come up with a, a, read, uh, a read structure. And that's because there is consultation going to be coming out very shortly from uh, the Scottish Government on the police, so it can be the people there with expertise that can uh, engage with that. I think the next one, 396, is the enterprise and arms. Well, which win in that yeah, one? Yeah, I, I mean, I. I have a big uh, the concern. My starting point in this is the, the concern that, that members of the I committee and, and even to an extent DG First Committee have over the commissioning process. And we're now getting rid of the commissioning process. Well, to an extent, because we're, we're bringing the two departments together. But what happens at the moment is EI Committee decide what they think the commission is and what they think is going to happen. Um, you know, we're going to clean the gullies once a year, and then it goes to DG First Committee, and DG First can interpret that a wee bit different. That actually it's only an average of once a year, so half the gullies going to get cleared for 25 years. You know. And, and effectively, the two committees departments have played off each other. And, you know, we need a situation whereby councillors make a decision and that's what gets implemented. And we don't have effectively another committee interpreting what they think the other committee has agreed to. And that's what happens at the moment. My fear is, if you have a, effectively a, a repeat of, of a DG First Committee, if you like, which I don't think is what's being suggested, but if you have a repeat of that, then you end up with the two things being played off each other. So we need a very clear structure. And particularly given the fact we're looking at area committees having a more... A, a significant role when it comes to, to certain uh, certain tasks that are currently tied up with DG First. I fear that you've got a communities committee that sets a budget, you've got an area committee that sets something, you may have a trade and arm committee that, you know, you could be all over the place and you, you need the minimum number of decisions to implementation. That really needs to be the principle. So I really worry what the role of an enterprise and arm of the council committee would be if it's purely to focus on those commercial decisions about the council effectively tendering for outside work, uh, that type of decision, that's fine. But I think the role of, of, of effectively scrutinise the implementation of decisions of a committee rests with the committee to make those decisions. So if the new EI committee decides we're going to fix the potholes, then that is the committee that oversees fixing the potholes, basically. And we shouldn't have this committee bouncing off each other. Rona, point. You know, th this part here, the enterprise arm, th th did officials sort of see it as, okay, we're going to transfer the grounds maintenance grass cutting to the community committee, uh, th therefore um, they will um, commission the work and scrutinise the work. So, I mean, th this enterprise and arm, it's not necessary now, is it? I think it was very much uh, with the idea about where uh, we were out there tendering for work and trying to, you know, uh, raise, you know, to generate income and bring it in. And I think there had been criticism in the past that that was an area that maybe didn't have enough scrutiny and members uh, didn't have enough oversight of that. So I know DG First Committee have addressed that uh, to some extent. Uh, but when we wrote that, I think the concern was actually also about timescales. Sometimes, you know, as a number of you will know in your own uh, work, that when you get asked to tender for business, you don't get terribly long. It comes out and there's a fortnight to do it. So it's about also the speed of response. You know, how, w with that oversight or, or with appropriate delegations, how can officers be allowed that almost commercial freedom uh, to make decisions and to go out there and, and tender in the time scales that the market will require. Thanks. That's where I seem to be that enterprise and trade. I think Colin summed it really well in terms of the argument why we should, should keep the well, why the two two organisations should should we keep that together so they're held accountable. But the procurement that just came out of my mind. You spoke about that. You're not on state and performing and things like that. So that's not uh, being a part of the administration. But procurement can something that's come to that as a potential that you 
there are subcommittees to take down stuff. And I think this is what we call right and left. It goes to enterprise and, and it pick up any loose ends in regards to security. And that's what I'd like to see. Full scrutiny of our hands. The, 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 one, the one hesitation I have is that, that clearly the EI committee will set a budget and the enterprise and arm of the council, if you like, as part of the economy, environment, and infrastructure committee will set a clear budget, a clear budget that includes income and it will raise to the enterprise and arm of the council, if you like. Um, can you have a situation whereby the EI committee may set a clear budget, a clear direction of travel, what they want to happen, and then you have a set another subcommittee, if you like, deciding actually we don't really want to do that. Um, you know, we don't actually tender for that, you know, we don't think what's well, going to impact the private sector, let's, let's stay away from that. You can't have that, you can't have another committee effectively undermining decisions taken by a service committee. That, that, that's a particular wing, if you like, department of, of, um, of um, the EI committee that have a head of service um, that's talking about the director of economy and environment infrastructure committee. You can't effectively have another committee undermining a decision taken by the EI committee. I think that's my hesitation whether we'd have, if there's a particular legitimate reason, nobody's given it yet, why you'd have a separate committee, I don't know. Um, but I'm nervous about that. Colin's right when he says that, and it shouldn't be. It should be accountable to that committee. It shouldn't be accountable. The enterprise may well be sitting there, but it should be have its accountability because it's taken on procurement. The enterprise. I think you've made the argument for why it should be standalone. It's a service committee to grow to a degree, but I don't see why it should take on that particular lump of business. We've spoke about this a lot uh, with the student performing. Try to bring that into some kind of order, and I think procurement enterprise inside the sector is perfect. Whether it sits under the EI committee, uh, EI structure or department, is a big question. Maybe it shouldn't sit there. Maybe it should sit in a corporate setting. Because it is a corporate thing we're taking. It's not an economic development thing. It's something we can take across the board. And I think that should certainly be left there and not necessarily have to be set. Because we're looking at the whole structure. The enterprise inside of the council shouldn't necessarily have to be sitting underneath the what will be the economy, environment, infrastructure department. Something that could be addressed when we're doing the first piece of work we're looking at built up to four main committees. Because part of the enterprise and arms is actually not just come under E and I, it's all an element in the community, it's all an element of education as well. So I think we need to take a look at how we how we do it at each service. Yeah. Okay, just just a, a quick uh, thought to, to put in. I think when we look to other councils, some have had a board set up just to make quick decisions and others have actually delegated it to corporate management team you know with within set criteria so you know these are options that we'll we can bring forward uh, in the next paper as well the future role of fairy committees in terms of participation of local communities well i think we've covered some of that in our earlier agenda item uh, participative budgeting and the future of locality plans. Now, again, this, I think, we have to wait until we decide how we set up the rest. Because they, they, they all logically fall on from each other. So, it would be a bit remiss to say this is what area committees are going to do. We haven't even decided what committees are going to do, what the main committees are going to do, and what they might delegate to area committees. The members are happy to leave that piece of work at the moment. Uh, and T10, Formation of Integration Joint Board, uh, Social work services delegation will also require to be uh, considered. Again, that that is also covered in department following grant to deal with that. So are members happy to uh, agree the recommendations as amended for matters to be discussed? Members happy with that? much. Item 5 is the uh, scheme of delegation and responsibilities to officers. Oh, just before, on that, on that last one, th this committee has always been called ad hoc subcommittee on review of schemes. Now, I don't know why it's ever called ad hoc, because ad hoc means it lasts for about six months. Time would run. There is a requirement by law anyway to review our standing orders once a year. I see there's recommendations in there for delegation as well. So why don't we just call it the uh, subcommittee, standing orders review subcommittee, and uh, 
Is it, it's, got, it's got to be there forever and a day. It's not required to be standing up for 70 years, so it's not a talk. It's pedantic. Anyway, I have five, scheme of delegations and responsibilities to officers. Uh, anything you want to add to the report? Well, Chair, if I can ask Matthew. Matthew. Just, just briefly introduce it if I can. Chair, um, obviously in front of you today, what we have is a, a comprehensive um, but draft uh, scheme, uh, which we fully acknowledge will require further re uh, refinement over the coming weeks. A Cu couple of particular areas and, and, and members have, have referred to it already in the meeting. Uh, one is clearly the head of service matching, and as that's completed over the next uh, couple of weeks or so, um, each of those individuals will be required to obviously review what is here and ensure that uh, what, what's here is, is absolutely uh, correct in terms of legislation and, and, and the powers that, that they have and, and require. Um, and also there's the recruitment of the head of legal and democratic services and clearly that individual will have a key role in, in the maintenance, the development and maintenance of, of this scheme going forward. In saying that, uh, what, what we have done is, is carried out quite a comprehensive piece of work comparing our own arrangements to, to those uh, elsewhere across Scotland, uh, Chair. Not to say that we're trying to copy others, um, but, but what we did find from that work is, is that a uh, vast majority of other authorities have a, a much more comprehensive scheme than, than we have had in, in the past. Um, and, and therefore, based on our desire for transparency and clarity and openness, uh, we have therefore developed here this uh, more comprehensive scheme, building on what we did previously and pulling together areas which were previously um, the responsibility of individual directors. So we're, we're not trying to do anything in addition to what we do, we're, we're just trying to pull it together into one place uh, for, for, that, for, the, for the reasons of transparency, etc. And also, probably quite importantly as well, uh, just to provide absolute clarity to, to officers around what they can and, and, and can't do. Um, so it, it, it really is trying to pull together best practice from elsewhere and, and, and consolidate what we've currently had in, in, in the past as well um, into a comprehensive reference document, if you like. Um, going forward, um, clearly there's a bit of work for us to do to, to, to refine this. Um, but what we, what we are sort of recommending as well is that this becomes a sort of a living document, if, if, if you will. Um, so we'd expect to you know, keep it up to date and, and keep it under regular review. And as an absolute minimum, sort of a, a, an annual, rec a, an annual um, confirmation of, of, of the scheme is, is, is clear. So, so as I say, it's a, it's a draft scheme. Um, more work will be required, and, and we acknowledge that. But we thought this was a, a, a good time to, to bring it here, uh, really to get some direction and, and some thoughts from us. Thanks very much. Just, just a couple of items I had, that was page uh, 83, <coughs> and it's uh, Assessor and DRO. Now, I thought we were setting up a joint board, but the uh, board was not there. Is there any further form you just uh, share? The other one was on page uh, 74, at the bottom 210, new legislation updating of powers. Uh, scheme may be updated by the appropriate director uh, notifying the chief executive of its legal services in writing in advance of the specific power which to exercise if this is not in conflict with or contradictory to any statutory provision, council of standing orders, council of policy or delegation to another officer. Effect may be given to such an extension immediately, and this scheme will be amended accordingly. Uh, just wondering is there, is there a need for that to go to officers and end company to each other? I, mean, I, can, I can understand if, if the law of the land changes saying that the director of education is responsible for such and such, then you've got to go down to a standing order and report that to the member. But if it's just a director coming forward and saying, I feel I can do this, and the chief executive 
uh, go ahead and do it and tell the council how they think it's uh, how they'd like to meet you. No be the other way about when you come to the elected member and ask for chairman's meeting. Fiona? Yeah, I, th I think I could, I could give an example of, and maybe this just doesn't reflect uh, what we're trying to uh, achieve, is that there's occasionally, um, you know, for instance, say in the, 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 the business there, where an officer perhaps isn't quite sure if they've got a statutory power, you know, to say, um, I don't know, re read a, a, a puppy farm or, 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 or work with police on a port, uh, which was some recent examples that we had. And uh, I think officers uh, were unclear whether they actually they had that delegated uh, power. So it would have been useful in that circumstance. They had to act immediately and reassure other authorities, uh, the police, et cetera, that we had that power uh, given to those officers. So there was a need for immediate action. But, so that would have been a case where I think it should come that way, but then it should be cleared up at the next appropriate committee. Happy that. You're talking about clarification of status. Powers, that's one thing. If there's just a director of fancy having the power to say something, but uh, he fancies to take a case with reference to that, yeah, that, that's totally different. That would be fine. No, I think any director would, but you never know. I mean, if, if you leave loophole, somebody's always going to drive a bus to it just to try it. Um, anything. Members get. That's the one that's it's self explanatory. I think, but I think that there, there has been occasions. And it's as much to protect officers as it is, whereby a particular major capital project the council and a committee might agree then gets changed. Um, and exactly who and members haven't had a say in that particular change or not even been informed of the reasons behind that particular change, that's where the difficulties arise. I think there's been a problem with that in the past, a number of projects. I think we have to make sure that whatever scheme we put in place, whether it's through the scheme of delegation or through standing orders, that we actually make it clear what should happen in circumstances like that. As much as anything else, pass the buck to members for a decision the public might not like. Um, but And also make sure that members are fully aware of changes to particular capital projects and they've had the authority to make those decisions. There's no point in agreeing a project and then a change is made without members having agreed that. And there's always a kind of, you know, it's a bit of a grey area at the moment and I think that needs to be looked at and be with some standing orders or clear guidance or a scheme of delegation. Much Anybody else? I'd be happy to agree the uh, recommendations. Ian? Happy, Chairman. There's one thing I meant, like yourself, I think it was in the previous one. I cannot, for love of mine, find, find the, the particular point I picked up on, but it was in regarding, uh, regards to the pension plan and the, or the board. And I've got the board and I've got the committee. Isn't it? It was due to proportionality, and I don't know if it's changed or not in regards to the way it's been set up, and that maybe needs to be the. I just thought I'd mention it because I've seen it. I can't even mind where I see it. I've seen it somewhere down here. It's, it's maybe just for, for later reference, that's uh, obviously what I think we're past it. But no, there's something mentioned page five and item three. Uh, this is talking about the union reps. It used to allow, but now they're covered by the new. It's a tidying up exercise. We, 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 we invited union reps to attend the pension fund meeting. And the government changed the legislation to set up these pension boards. And that gave the unions automatic right in the pension board. So it's just a tidy up exercise. That's all. That was it wasn't it, it was the representation. There's only three council members on it. Is that the case? It just, and it's, it's the proportionality would be changed. Sorry, Chair, and it's maybe something going back to a different date. I just no. thought I'd say it. I mean, the pension board hasn't got any power. I don't understand it because I'm on that. I just thought it was in my mind, so I just say it whether it's relevant or not. Pension board basically talking about. Better talking. Uh, the only item of business I've got is that it's an issue I've raised before, and funnily enough, another member raised it with me, and that is the, the issue of the service level agreements, which I think we need to take a look at how we handle them. Two separate issues. A, we seem to have service level agreements left, right and centre without any reference to elected members. I really feel there should be a method for elected members agreeing to uh, service level agreements. There are service level agreements out there which are told, have never even been seen by the legal department of this council or the governance department of this council, and that is not separate. So I think that's the job to speak for you all SLA. But I think we need service level agreements with 
be approved by and signed off by elected members. And uh, you also need a way to police them as well, an audit them. Uh, one elected member has made the point to me that we've got a, an organisation that would well be running a, a community facility and uh, the committee there saying to other organisations, no, and I've, I've had this myself with a community centre where you've got a management committee there, somebody wants to run a youth club. Oh well, no, we can't have Wayne's in here, we'll elect the place. Now, if it's in the SLA, that's for the benefit of the community. But if an organisation, if, if, if a body complains to the folks who are running the show and they say, no, we're not having you in here, there doesn't seem to be a point of appeal for us to get our business because I think we need to make a case to them that's in there. But if an organisation in the village isn't happy that they're getting access to the village hall, come to us and we'll have an officer in the town. So it's a whole question of SLA is how we uh, set them up. Uh, should be approved by elected members. So we have an ombudsman there. It's the very few occasions that arises to give guidance to uh, people who've got SLA who must allow the folks to come in and then we'll set them up again. Just off the cuff, obviously, but you've got two options there. You can fed the procurement committee for his one, or even differently, we've got a, an actual complaints committee. So we've got if folk complain, Exhausted, they went through as we do with employment appeals. Actually, the complaints come out at the end of our elected members and start to see the final outcome they need before it goes forward to the ombudsman. I mean, I think a complaints come out would be a good way of dealing with that and other types of complaints, likes of stuff we've had in social work and that. But we exhaust it, see it finished, and off it goes to the ombudsman. Well, I'm thinking think a more simple thing that if somebody's got a, an issue, it would be if community centre's the ideal one, if you've got a service level management committee and this kind of body, that's community centre, that's what their duties are. And they say to a play group, no, you can't have it because we've got kids in here. Well, but they, they come to the appropriate office and that will just goes back to the management committee and say, look, this is your agreement with council. You can proceed with your business and you can do this. So it's, it's, no the, it's no major issue, but there's a few, few niggles that have brought to my attention. Listen, Jim, I wonder, wonder what, what the route is at the moment, and just over here. I know this is just a, an ad hoc agenda item, it's any other common business, but I'd be interested to hear what the route is at the moment. Yeah, I think your, your point's well made, and I think the fact is that we've got service level agreements that are, in fact, in some cases, leases or licences, and we've got, we've got some that should be contracts, and I would hope that the contract management review that, that we, we talked about yesterday at the steering group, and it'll be coming forward. Uh, it would, would cover a lot of these things. And also, it, the, you know, the very term service level agreement, I mean, some of them are actually real contracts. And, and so why are we not calling them that? So I, I think we have got a lot of work to do there and I'll certainly um, take that on. I think one apology, and that's uh, for Brodie and... Uh, <coughs> I don't think the independent would have